Through the seed collection and select what I'm gonna plant this year now what I'm gonna show you is a bit crazy I'm gonna first select on my own what's the the plan for this year and then I'm, I'm gonna show you a couple of them I'm not gonna go through all of them because as I told you guys I'm gonna be planting about 800 plants but just a, an overview of what I'm gonna do and what I want to plant and then as winter crops come we're gonna talk about those and and so on so without further ado this is kind of my seed collection and some things are individually put over there some are just bugs and in each bug Basically, they're organized like you can see here Tomatoes, this is beans and peas, peppers, onions, cabbage um, I don't know, corn, pumpkin, sunflowers Aromatic herbs, trees So, I think in total I have about I don't know how many I have that, That's how many I have Plus, again, here is the last batch that the, of seeds that I bought before we moved so this is like next year and two years from now batches and this is I think about 300 different plants and multiple varieties or alum varieties of set plants plus this is the older seeds that I'm gonna be planting this year so I will choose based on the summer season from here and then I'll let you guys know exactly what I'm gonna be going with if anything I would really love to have a seed bank a seed collection a seed vault like the ones in in the Arctic and in Norway and so on because I think we need to save and protect uh, the biodiversity of the planet not just the food seeds that we consume but the wild flowers wild plants wild herbs wild grasses wild trees each country should have at least 10 if not 50 if not 100 seed vaults where they keep their local uh, adapted to their ecosystem seed that's a partnership between countries that should exist because the way we've been treating nature until now um, she's kind of pissed off with us so we should show her that we at least care about future generations and about the diversity of the planet which we are destroying to the tune of a species becoming extinct every 20 minutes yeah i think every 20 minutes so let's go through the seeds let's not go down this gloomy uh, rabbit hole and yes i am uh, in my parents-in-law's apartment our apartment is still in demo demo stage so we cannot move there yet okay seat time Seed time with me! The first batch of uh, seeds that I've selected for this year We're gonna start from above Sweet Corn Swift Sweet Corn Golden Bantam Sweet Corn Golden uh, Bloody Butcher Sweet Corn Early Bird Sweet Corn Mirai Picnic uh, Sweet Corn uh, True Gold Heirloom Red Popping Corn Strawberry uh, sweet corn fiesta, sweet corn glass gem. Uh, I think this is another strawberry. I, I got doubles as well. This is a squash like pumpkin hybrid. It's called Maro. I think that's how you pronounce it. You guys Google. Google everything because I don't have pictures uh, right now. I will keep you updated as they develop. 
then I have sunflower giant gray striped I love them I got another sunflower called Titan I got another sunflower called Mongolian giant like I did grow this in the past and the um, the head of the sunflower is so big and it's so heavy that you need to put splinters or supports underneath it so they can ripe that's how big it grows it's insane zucchini yellow golden i tried to grow this last year in the in the planters and i didn't succeed but now i have the proper environment squash muscat de provence i think that's how you'd say it then pumpkin howden uh, pumpkin dill dills atlantic giant oh my i've seen how it's called giant for a reason it's humongous then there's another squash called walton butternut squash hunter f1 and courgette cocosal this is a green variety uh, also we bought some some uh, butternut squash from the shop and it was super delicious so i saved seeds from that one thanks god that we still have seeds in our produce in the shop that's the first batch of, of, of uh, seeds if you want to see how they look how the the mature product looks like when it's all um, grown up and if you are interested in it then just google it you will find pictures that's how i found them and i'm sure that a lot of uh, seed sellers from all over the world will provide you with if not all of them most of these uh, varieties because they're most of them heirloom but not all of them you, you saw that there's some of them uh, f1 which f1 is not a bad thing it just means that it's a established hybrid that's been cultivated after it has been hybridized for multiple generations and now it's a, it's its own thing yeah okay i'll prepare another batch of seeds and i'll show you what i'm gonna do next next we're gonna talk about the beans and the peas i don't have a humongous collection of beans uh, and peas at least not from this generation this is the generation of 20 2018 2019 2020 uh, and i want to plant as many of these varieties this year because i want to save them so what survives what grows grows and i'll keep seeds i'll keep new seeds of this variety so got three runner beans here one is called runner bean bean lady die another one is enorma because it's big it's, uh, okay <laughs> And the last runner bean is called Scarlet Emperor. Beautiful, beautiful, I don't know yet. Uh, then I got two peas. One is called Oregon Sugar Pod and the other one is called Alderman. Then I have a broad bean called uh, Grano Violetto. I love broad beans. And then a dwarf French Safari bean. I growed it last year in the uh, planter garden. Um, yeah. I mean it was okay again space crowded didn't have much stuff but i will use these dwarf beans this year on the growing beds here and there just to sequester some nitrogen uh, because they don't take too much space and then the last one climbing italian bean called marvel of venice so that's the beans next we have cucumbers and carrots so we have Cucumber um, Market More 76. I did grow this last year and I had good success even in the plant garden. I have a cucumber called Early Spring um, Burpless. I don't know what that means. Uh, then the next one, Piccolo di Pargi. Pargi. I don't know how you pronounce that. I did try this one last year. I didn't have good success with it. Next one is called Bet Alpha and the last one is the Cucamelon. I mean no year without Cucamelons. I love them. Uh, Carrots Rainbow Mix, Autumn King, Atomic Red, Dragon. Ooh, this sounds dangerous. And then the last one is called Carrot uh, Yellow, uh, Solar Yellow. Next we are in the territory of the herbs and we love herbs. We have lemon, uh, lemon mint, oregano, thyme, the, the common thyme, and then I have also the uh, purple creeping thyme, blue spice basil, uh, napolitano, uh, boloso basil, uh, genovese basil, mint, the, just the basic peppermint, sage, broad-leaved, 
Salvia Nimorosa, the Violet Queen, Rosemary, the classic Rosemary. Then I have two types of dill, one called Bouquet and the other one called Mammoth. And then two types of parsley, one is called uh, Moss Curled and then the other one Italian Giant. And I, I am 100 million percent sure that I have more varieties, especially I need to have um, coriander because if I don't have coriander then I'm going to get kicked out of the house and sleep on the mat because I love parsley therefore there's multiple varieties of parsley and I have more somewhere I think in the in the box that has cover crops and flowers but my missus loves coriander and hates parsley so I need to make sure that I'm growing some coriander otherwise I'm gonna be sleeping at the garden. Na, 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 na. Yep, that is true. Next, we're gonna have kind of a mix of of vegetables and fruits. So we're gonna start with two varieties of asparagus. One is called Precoce d'Argentuil. The other one is called Converse Colossal. It's not to be confused with Converse Colossal. That's a big shoe. <laughs> Uh, then we have celery, two types of celery. One is called uh, Golden Self Blanching, the other one is called Utah. Aubergines, Long Purple, an Italian heirloom, and then Black Beauty. This is more like the classic chunky one that we all know, and this is like the very thin and long uh, variety. I've tried both of them, I had success with this one in the tiny planter garden. Then I have fennel. Uh, Florence. Two types of strawberry, one is called Alpine, the other one is called Four Seasons. I'm very excited to try them and add them to the collection, now that I don't already have like 75 plants. Anyway, now you can see where the priority stands, yeah? Melons. <laughs> I love watermelons of all shapes and sizes and colors and seasons. I love them fresh, I love them pickled, so uh, we have Hale's Best Jumbo, then we have Charleston Grey, Crimson Sweet, Jubilee, Green Sprouting Calabres, Klondike Blue Ribbon and Sugar Baby. Sugar Baby is the tiny one, they literally grow, I don't know, size of an apple, of a large apple and you can pickle them and they're fantastic. Then we have two types of parsnip, one is called White Gem, the other one is called Guernsey or something like that, then Kale. Nero di Toscana and Scarlet, favorites, grow them last year, we love them, uh, mainly me. Uh, then we have cauliflower all year round, spinach, gar uh, giant winter, Paris island cause for the lettuce, Swiss chard rhubarb, um, we did grow this last year and it was growing all year round and it was delicious, we're gonna do it again first time, we're gonna grow okra, it's called burgundy, and then mustard greens, uh, Mibuna or Maibuna. I don't know how you pronounce that, but this is this is this batch. We're down to the tomatoes now, and as you can see, I have a problem, and I need to address it because I have just counted it: 54 different varieties of tomatoes. Now, there may be one that's a double here and there but as we go we're gonna identify if that's the case anyway so we have azoichka beautiful amazing yellow tomato i had them last year in the planter uh, it was delicious big daddy i think this is a beef steak if i remember next one is called cuore di bo i think this is the bull heart or ox heart one uh, very delicious amazing next one daterino uh, purple cal calabash Heinz like literally the the tomato variety that Heinz uses for its ketchup pyramid cherry baby um, Do I have another cherry baby anywhere? We'll see um, Current gold rush delicious Kellogg's breakfast black truffle so they're all tomatoes. I'm not gonna say tomato this and tomato that. Next one, brandy wine pink, golden sunburst, delicious, amazing. Beef master, German orange strawberry, Cherokee purple. I'm excited about this. Banana legs, Czech bush, gardener's delight. Um, 
Pantano Romanesco, I think that's it. Uh, chocolate cherry, uh, gold, uh, green zebra, old German, Principe Burghese. I did grow this, they were delicious. Christmas grapes, black cherry. Okay, I think I saw a black cherry before, no? No, it was cherry baby. Okay, black cherry. Uh, mortgage lifter, this is classic. Silver fir tree, never never tried this. I think it's the uh, green one with like gray stripes, we'll see. Sweet Million F1, I did try this one. Chocolate stripes, San Marzano, classic. Charlie Chaplin, Ukrainian purple, legend. Uh, Marman Super Precoce, Mascota. This is, I think it's a tiny, tiny one. That's a windowsill one. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Um, let me just show you. And you guys pronounce it for me. Next one, Ola Polka, Yellow Pear, Honeybee, Plum Lemon, uh, window box red, another one just like the mascota, the tiny windowsill ones. This is Costoluto Fiorentino, Marman Super Peco. Okay, so this is a double, so it's 53 instead of 54. Rusella, Soldaki, Moskvich, this was delicious. Thessaloniki, Ananas Noir, Hillbilly, Gigantomo, Garden Pearl. I don't know, let me show it to you guys, and if you're interested, you can. Uh, ch check it for yourself giant tree and tigrella so that's it 53 uh, different varieties of tomatoes and of course you know I'm gonna try to grow at least two plants of each because I will have four rows of 20 meters each and if I leave about 40 to 50 centimeters in between them then I can grow at least two or three of each variety so a lot of tomatoes for me na, na, na. and for you because you're gonna see them so I mean sharing is caring no I think we need to go back to the tomatoes and kind of discuss about it a bit because that's excessive and I don't know about you but I've seen a lot of people on the internet a lot of homesteaders at least my favorite homesteaders they are crazy about tomatoes oh so I'm wondering what makes tomatoes so sexy? What has this appeal that people love them so much? Because only a couple of hundred years ago, they were considered poisonous and nobody wanted to touch them with a hundred foot pole. So actually there's a really good video on the history of tomatoes on a channel called Tasting History with Max Miller. You guys should watch that because I mean, it's amazing how the tomato was vilified and demonized as a killer of kings <laughs> uh, only to be reanimated, reinstated into our, into our diets uh, by, um, I think it was Sicilian, like any, uh, an Italian chef that might have also created pizza or invented the first pizza. Well, yeah, there's something about tomatoes that, um, that attracts me so much. I love growing them. I love the smell when I walk, walk past a tomato plant. It just really releases that fragrance. Um, I don't know. It's, it's such a, a sexy plant. <laughs> I think I'm in love with tomatoes and maybe that's why I have so many varieties. I can't wait to grow them. I can't wait. I, I, I think also because from a tiny seed you can actually see the miracle of life. You plant a tiny seed that barely exists, that doesn't look like much, and then in a couple of months you see this delicious, sweet and potentially sour or sweet and sour and full of flavor and aroma and lycopene which is essential for our health or and well function of our body uh, and you cannot get that from store-bought tomatoes they're plastic they're plastic they're picked raw after they've been grown hydroponically without any nutrition with fucking drugs literally like a junkie and then they've been gassed in the trucks while they've been transported under ethylene gas 
and we eat that and we wonder why it tastes like plastic well because it is plastic it smells like plastic smells tastes like plastic look like plastic but we still buy it because it is that sex appeal that tomato has and we want to eat them all year round and theoretically you can eat them all year round if you have a heated greenhouse or if you preserve it uh, eating tomato sauce and bouillons and all of the produce that you can make by preserving tomatoes uh, is almost like eating the fresh one if you have it from a natural organic regenerative source <sighs> yeah maybe one day i will have a high tunnel that's heated and i can grow tomatoes all year round that's sexy you guys tell me your opinion what makes tomato sexy that's the the question of the day why people are so obsessed with tomatoes anywhere on the planet you go i mean they they care about the cucumbers they love their potatoes don't touch their tomatoes because they're gonna stab you <laughs> so yeah tomatoes what makes them so sexy write down in the comments let me know I am generally curious about what makes tomato so sexy and so appealing. Good morning. It's about 7 in the morning. Had a very early start today. And I'm happy I did because the birds are so beautiful themselves and their song is so beautiful as well. And I've noticed that it doesn't happen throughout the whole day, it's especially in the morning and in the evening that they sing the most beautiful songs. So I think I'll make this a, a habit now of coming in quite early. Of course the, the good weather is going to encourage me to come quite early because honestly like half past 4 a.m. the sun is coming up so there's enough um, natural light for me to actually come here today it's all about planting uh, inside of the greenhouse so i already have the soil inside coffee is brewing i'll have to have some breakfast because i did wake up around half past 5 a.m so yeah no time for breakfast i came here as quick as i i could i'll move all of that straw uh, in the midway uh, or mid alley of the of the greenhouse so i can use the straw bed as a table because i don't have a table yet in the greenhouse that's a project for this summer but now i'm going to use the straw as a table as a support for all of my trays that i'm going to be starting not sure if i'm going to finish today as i said before i learned to appreciate more the time needed for everything but i will try my best so first thing on the list prepare the straw move it all to the middle uh, then i'll actually you i have some tape i'll patch the greenhouse it's not broken it's not anything but i want to take uh, later on when it dries up tape and just tape this to the main body so that it's kind of you know as hermetically sealed as possible like this all over the place because if i'm starting the seedlings inside i need the greenhouse to be as warm as possible and the weather is quite i wouldn't say bitchy but it's quite unpredictable right now so i would hate to have like a week you we call seedlings very tiny and sensitive and then in the week in the night to get like a nasty frost and then lose everything because that would be very bad i got seed reserves but that's not the point i don't want to waste seed so step number one move the straw in the middle insulate or like close down properly the greenhouse then mix the soil with the perlite and make my, my potting mix and yeah then just plant boom 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 i won't take too much time here in the greenhouse with the camera because the lenses are fogging like crazy all i've been doing for the last 10 minutes is clean the lens and unfog it it's really cold outside but in the greenhouse oh my was this a good investment or what it's really really warm and cozy uh, what I want to tell you 
I will share with you is what I'm using to make my potting mix. Now, everybody has their own recipe. This is what's been working for me for the last three years, so this is what I'm using. First of all, I have uh, just a classic standard compost, vegetable compost. It kind of says universal vegetable potting mix. So I'm using that. It's already inside here. Uh, apart from the soil, I'm using perlite. You can buy this at any shops or I bought it online because everything is closed here. Everything is under lockdown. And my secret ingredient, if you can call it that, is this. Now, I have been using this uh, in the past and I've shared this with you in previous videos. It's called Mikos. It's a mycorrhizal inoculant, meaning that this is going to help the roots of the baby plants create mycorrhizal networks or connections, communions, uh, symbiotic relationship with beneficial mycorrhizal uh, fungi. Now, I think all fungi and mycorrhiza are, are beneficial, um, but that's different discussion. This is going to actually give them um, a boost. It's like moving to a new town with your whole family and your close group of friends. You know, you have community, you have a network of support. So this is what's going to be, because as soon as the root systems that are already in symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizal network uh, are planted into the soil, those mycorrhizal networks expand and they create like a, literally like a web, like the internet throughout the whole soil. So all of these beds underneath the soil is going to be a massive communication network. Let's put it this way, okay? And then that, I don't know, pepper plant from there is going to be able to communicate with the cherry tree. And then the cherry, once it has been uh, connected to this network, is going to be able to speak to that guy and to that guy and to that guy and, and so on. The mycorrhizal networks are some of the largest organisms on the planet. Uh, I think the biggest one is in Oregon and it's 2,400 acres uh, of the same mycorrhizal network organism, so the same DNA and it's maybe 1,000 years old. I, I don't remember the facts exactly, but you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You guys do some research, you'll see. So I hope that now, because I don't have everything secluded in a, a planter garden uh, in two square meters in London, uh, it's not just going to help this soil. It's going to expand left and right, front and back, and it's going to send this mycorrhizal network underneath the ground and help everybody's soil. Because if you're not tilling and if you're not disturbing the soil, you're not killing or interrupting this network. And if you do in small places like I did when I installed the greenhouse, it will regenerate, it will grow back. You know, the one cell, cell thick uh, wall, this, this fungi, hyphae and mycorrhizal, imagine they're like octopus but with infinite tentacles, yeah? The main benefit of this, apart from being a communication network and keeping every, you know, plant connected to each other is the transfer of nutrients and water. So let's say we're going to a drought and the plants at the beginning of the garden are suffering tremendously from a lack of water because, I don't know, it hasn't rained in a month or so. Well, the plants, that are closer to the creek are gonna have plenty of water and they're gonna mine that water have an abundance of it and then the mycorrhizal network is gonna move that water slowly 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 all the way to the front of the property where those plants needed the most hence allowing me to have a steady harvest, allowing me to have healthy plants, allowing me to water less and use less fresh water because we all know it's starting to become the most expensive commodity on the planet because we freaking polluted and poisoned every water system that we came in contact with. So there's only benefits to having an established mycorrhizal network. Uh, I can rave about this for hours because I'm in love with it, but I have a video about the, you know, the whole shebang about this uh, product. Now, I'm not saying this product is the best, 
many people out there say that um, you cannot, I don't know, trick nature, you cannot enhance nature. Well, it's not about tricking or enhancing nature. It's about getting a head start. It's about working with nature because this is of nature. This is organic. This is natural. This is something that uh, a business is growing in their labs, just like Paul Stamets is growing uh, agaricon strains and you know lion's mane and shiitake and rishi mushrooms uh, for medicinal properties the same thing yeah i have no affiliation with this company but especially from from the states um, it's called extreme gardening um, and a lot of my crazy homesteaders are using it as well and swear by it so i don't know you guys have a look if you're interested go out there try it you can buy smaller packages i bought the big one because you know i kind of need it but this is my potting mix i'm not gonna go crazy with this basically what i'm gonna do is add you see inside which each of these bags you get this measurement so basically for one bag of 50 liters of soil like that and for half a bag of perlite that's 20 liter volume like that I'm, I'm gonna use three of these big scoops or four I'm generous today early early bird gets the worm so I woke up early I'm gonna be very generous I'm at that point where I, I I don't hope it's gonna work I don't hope it's gonna help I don't hope it's gonna um, create a fantastic ecosystem I know that so if you if you trust me which I'm not asking you to by the way do your own homework don't be a follower be a student but if you if I've made a good point uh, you try it and uh, I'll, I'll put that video here somewhere where I speak um, in full detail about this product and, and how I used it even in, in London where I was getting about three, four hours of direct sunlight a day and I still had plenty of success and productivity because of that. And the funny thing is that when, um, and again, I have pictures and videos about this when i used the mycos uh, mycos in the planters in london mushrooms came up now i didn't look into them if they were edible or not but we we had mushrooms because there was a my, uh, mycorrhizal network over there and when i had to take them down and throw them away because the owner of the flat when we moved didn't want to have them over there there was a humongous amount of life and uh, of mycorrhizal networks over there and i think i have a video because i was heartbroken when i had to take it all down and and destroy two years of soil building uh, and if i do I'll, I'll put it right into this uh, video with time and love you can create something magical something that's gonna not necessarily pay you in in you know in return but it's gonna be useful for your kids for your grandkids and you know for the seventh generation like the first nation people always teach us about so maybe we should listen to them more and create systems and gardens and forests and food systems in general that don't extract with total disregard for the future and destroy maybe that can give back to nature so that nature can give us even more abundance but yeah this is my soil mix i want to share that with you love you and see you soon
this is what I'm calling the first round of planting I managed to insulate I would say insulate the greenhouse with the tape this is how it is it keeps the uh, condom I don't know it keeps the main body of the greenhouse together because it's made out of two units I would say so you have the the skillet the base and then you have the main tarp that comes on top of it the tarp was flapping about every time the wind was coming but because I had the straw on both sides of the greenhouse it was pushing towards the outside so today I moved uh, all of the straw in the middle so I can have like a table thanks God that I still have all of this straw that can act like a table and I, I freed up the sides meaning that I could pull properly the the plastic and tie it all together like this with tape I need just a tiny bit more for over there so I'm gonna buy some more but basically this is it and even if it's cloudy and overcast like this inside it's really really warm and you can see that the flappiness if I can call it that is not so prominent as before and then I have 450 more empty ones over there but I don't want to fill them up with soil just yet because I'm a bit worried about this weather so I'm gonna wait for a while finish those ones I mean 416 is still an achievement for today and now I'll, I'll call it a success uh, insulating the greenhouse and planting 416 seeds I think in anybody's book that's a full day of work but also I'm happy that finally after a month and one week we're ready to to start pl planting the seeds and, and seedlings uh, and that's after we prepared all of the property with beds and deep mulch um, wood chips in the pathways and after I've directly sown and planted the corn squash courgettes um, potatoes onions and planted some fruit trees and uh, quite a lot of berry bushes now I'm gonna focus a lot on uh, I would say production but that sounds so perverted and so wrong but it is that I'm gonna focus on planting as many varieties of um, basically all the plants that I have uh, and I'm, I'm gonna stop uh, you know that rush to buy more berry bushes buy more fruit trees buy more this and that because I want to take the rest of the year as an observation year I want to see what variety of apples we have here what varieties of cherries we have here the plums the flowers the berry bushes which uh, aside from the maybe 12 or, or 13 that we bought this year the previous owner has berry bushes everywhere so I would just want to observe harvest taste experience what we already have and if we like we'll multiply and perpetuate those ones if not next year and another year we can buy the the um the berry bushes and the trees and the sortiments that we would love to have now i have my mulberries the white and the black mulberries and i'm happy you know that that's all i wanted to complete what was already here so yeah the next the next part of the year is going to be taking care of the seedlings making sure that they grow planting them right now and then just observing what's happening because the may cherry even if it's may already it's starting to blossom now i think maybe middle of june we'll have some um some cherries hopefully but this makes me very happy because if the trees are starting to blossom it means that the pollinators will have a lot of work to do and a lot of food for them as well the fruit trees and berry bushes 
flowers will bring variety to the pollinators, to the bumblebees and the bees and the butterflies. I've seen a couple of them. I have like a, a band of, of bumblebees who are like extremely hard workers. They're really trying their best to pollinate and to extract the nectar from each and every plant, flower, weed. But it's not much variety. There's literally, I have maybe one, two, three borage plants and some of the, the the flowers that we have from the previous owner are starting to open now. It's not that much. So fingers crossed for them. I'm really happy that they're getting an improved diet and, and menu options. Uh, and also, yeah, for us, because we're actually going to finally see what grows here. And I need to start planting and I'll start with tomatoes because I got 53 varieties of tomatoes. Anything from beef tomatoes to medium tomatoes to cherry tomatoes, current tomatoes. The tiniest ones to the biggest ones, determinate, indeterminate, in between determinate and indeterminate. I got them all. So I'll plant them. And as soon as the planting is done, then I need to focus on the next project, which is preparing the trellises for all of these tomatoes and, uh, and all of the cucumbers, which trellises we're gonna put over there as we discussed before. That's the plan. See you soon.